let's focus our whole time there. And I, I don't think Oh yeah. There is no colloquium that day, because it was in Berlin for three hours. So <laughs>
faces in the audience, a lot of uh, familiar faces as well. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm Jason Delborn. I am um, in the Faculty in Forestry and Environmental Resources and also one of the cluster faculty in the Genetic Engineering Society. I'm coordinating the colloquium in our experimental discussion section, which is happening every Thursday following. Please join us. Um, this week, we have uh, Roy Den Sa, uh, who is well known within GDS. I'll just say, say a couple things about him. Um, so uh, he's, a, he's an NC State alum. Um, he has a bachelor's in zoology um, and also a master's in microbiology. His thesis title was the role of ARC, FNR, and FER in the expression of CAT E, CAT G, and Team A effects on hydroperoxidases in E. coli. Which, <laughs> <laughs> I, I assume most of you have read. <laughs> um, but I say that because, I mean, so Royden, you know, I, when I think about Royden, I think if only there had been a GES graduate program for you beforehand, it would have prepared you for the enormous amount of challenges that you faced over the last couple of years. So Royden, um, as you may know, is a uh, program coordinator yep. uh, for, for um, the G-Bird project, which is genetic biocontrol of invasive rodents. Um, and he came on the scene um, without a lot of expertise in thinking about conservation as a professional, um, without a background in thinking about the complexities that we wrestle with in GES in terms of social science and humanities and policy and things like that. But he jumped in with such enthusiasm and with such humility um, and with such a, a sense of, I need to learn and absorb what this community of people and professionals is doing to be able to do my job well. Um, he's been a total inspiration to a lot of us. Um, and he has served our community, and he has provided leadership in our community. Um, and I know that he, uh, and the other thing about Royden is that he is so good about expressing gratitude um, to the people around him. Um, it's really one of his finest traits. Um, and so I'm excited to hear from him as a kind of update on what it's been like to be thrown into this world um, and try to make sense of it for the last uh, two years. Um, almost exactly two years on the job. Two years this week. Yeah. So uh, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Royden. But before, I just forgot, any other GES related announcements for the next week or so? Yes, I have one for you, Patty. Thank you. Uh, let's see, is uh, Jill Kuenhardt? I'm saying that right. Uh, we'll be available to meet with people on March 15th. Uh, so check out the website for the upcoming events and to register to meet with them. Right. I think there was a little bit of a blur on the announcement that we spoke about who she is. Um, and there wasn't a way to include her in the unfortunately. Um, the other announcement is just next week, Megan Sear, are you here? Yes, there you are. Hi. I uh, was going to be talking, and she'll be talking more about some of the technical aspects of this project, so we'll get a kind of one-two punch, which is fantastic. Um, and this Thursday, the discussion section that we normally have at um, 2321 Gardner Hall that I usually facilitate, I have a, an on-campus workshop to attend, so Royden has graciously agreed to attend that and facilitate the discussion um, for that group of students and anybody else who's interested. Okay. Any other questions around? Yeah, John. I don't know if it's so possible we'll go Michael Spector's talk. Oh, yeah. yeah. Thank you for reminding me. Yeah. Michael Spector is a, a New Yorker journalist um, who has covered some issues around genetic engineering, especially gene drives. He wrote a big paper about that. Um, and he is speaking, I believe, at 5.30 in the Hunt Library. Um, and it's one of those things where they tell you to register, but I'm sure you can show up. And yeah, that's in the announcement. OK, great. Excellent. Thank you, Jason. Um, it's easy to be grateful when you're working with the people that I'm working with. Uh, it was actually two years ago this week that I started in this position. And uh, it was with the opening of the Roadmap to Gene Drives uh, workshop. And so uh, it has been an eventful two years. And I'm gonna give this, this colloquium talk came out of a little bit of a program update for GES. So uh, I expect a robust discussion. And I'm going to give kind of structural updates and uh, then we can talk about societal impacts. But um, as Jason said, Megan is going to be speaking more on the technical aspects next week. So I'm going to talk about more of the programmatic, non-biological aspects. Let's see if I can make this thing work. Yes. So 
This program has evolved over the last three years uh, and it is focused on the conservation of biological diversity. And so really that's going to be kind of framing the talk is not genetic engineering, but what we're trying to do, what the organization that I work with is trying to do in genetic engineering as a tool. So I'm going to speak about island conservation, both uh, the verb and the noun, and then go ahead and give a little bit of a program update. So an assumption is that uh, everyone in this room agrees that biological diversity or biodiversity is critically important to everyone. Um, that has been shown by uh, the set of organizations like the International Union for the Conservation of Nature and programs like Save Our Species that are supported by the World Bank, which recognizes that uh, the conservation of biological diversity is uh, paramount to sustainable development economically. Um, the GEF supports SOS. The Convention of Biological Diversity, one of the opening lines is that it affirms that the conservation of biodiversity is a concern of all of humankind. So again, this is more of just kind of setting up why we're looking at what we're looking at. Um, so why is everyone all of a sudden focused on biological diversity? Uh, a good assumption is that it is under threat. The red list includes about 22,000, this is a couple years old, but in 2014 it includes uh, thousands of species that are threatened, which is endangered, critically endangered, extinct in the wild, vulnerable. Um, and it's considerable percentages of all of the different clades and families. So we can, we can go forward with the uh, idea that biological diversity is threatened and uh, what island conservation really this program is looking at is islands specifically and why the why, why do we look at islands it's only a small portion of the world's bio um, terrestrial land mass it's about five percent but when you frame it in where does the biological diversity on earth reside 20% uh, of all bird, reptile, and plant species exist on those 5% of land mass islands. Now, when you look at some of the threats, 40% of all critically endangered species exist on the islands, and the sad aspect is 61% of all extinctions since 1500s have occurred on islands. So, if we focus on islands, we can have make a significant dent in. Uh, stemming the, the issue of loss of biological diversity. So I'll leave you uh, last with a quote uh, from the writer David Bond. As we extinguish a large portion of the planet's diversity, we also um, we lose also a large portion of the world's beauty, complexity, intellectual interest, spiritual depth, and ecological health. Why did I include that? Because it really uh, kind of cements or aligns with what I understand the Genetic Engineering Society Center looking at, which is not only the science, but some of the values associated with um, the science. So, Island Conservation is an organization, which is the organization that hires and hired me. Our mission is to prevent extinctions by removing invasive species from islands. It's short, it's very focused, that's what we do. Um, I work in the area of innovation, and so uh, that's really where this uh, program uh, came out of from an island conservation standpoint. Does it work? When we remove invasive species from islands, does it actually prevent extinction? Does it prevent extinctions? And the answer is yes. When uh, invasive species are removed from islands, organisms like the pinzone giant tortoise are brought back from the brink of extinction. This was identified as a uh, uh, animal that was extinct in the wild because of rat predation on the eggs and hatchlings. And uh, human intervention in collecting the eggs when they were laid, rearing them to a point where the uh, turtles can, the tortoises can defend themselves against the rats, and then replaced on pins on the islands. So a lot of human intervention. And after the eradication, 
uh, natural clutches of, uh, of pendulum giant tortoises were uh, reared in the wild. So um, that is an anecdote, but island conservation exists uh, in trying to use the best evidence-based uh, aspects, and we have the database of invasive island species eradications uh, on, the, on the website. It's a partnership, of course, um, and it indicates successful island eradications, uh, and it overwhelmingly results in the uh, positive benefit to island ecosystems. And some of this was published in PNAS a couple of years ago, uh, talking about the expected outcomes and actually unexpected outcomes as well. So how big is the problem and what is currently being done about invasive species on islands? Well, the problem is pretty big. Um, about 88% of critically endangered and endangered vertebrates on islands are affected by four invasive rodent species, three rat and the house mouse. Um, and again, you can go to uh, some of the maps and data uh, databases on the Island Conservation website and learn more. Um, and how, how not only Island Conservation but other organizations deal with invasive rodents is the use of rodenticide. Rodenticide uh, has challenges associated with it, uh, including off-target uh, issues, uh, including cost, including uh, the fact that we cannot do eradications using uh, rodenticone and rodenticide on islands that have human inhabitants. So there are a lot of limitations. Currently, about only about 15% of the islands that have critically endangered and endangered species um, are have rodenticide as a feasible method. So we really got to look at different ways of doing things if we want to continue to make a dent in um, the. Uh, work that we're doing. So the way we have done that is really try to be mindful and strategic about it uh, and focus. So uh, the, what is the point of greatest impact for innovation in this sphere? And that is uh, invasive rodents. We've talked about uh, the impact of invasive rodents on islands. It's pretty great. But also if we uh, want to match the technology to the need, you know, rodenticone and rodenticides are only about 10 or 15 islands a year we can only do after conducting the risk assessment, so we need to really expand the ability of technology to address this issue. So a horizon scan was conducted by uh, not only island conservation folks, but a lot of some of the folks in this room to look at what is going to be the next technology. What is the most promising technology to look at? And uh, the thing that came out of this is uh, is looking at genetic biocontrol of invasive rodents. So that's where our focus um, started. And then uh, selecting the investments, both incremental, looking at stakeholder engagement, uh, um, ways of respond, uh, innovating more responsibly than has been done in the past, especially with this genetic technology, and transformational aspects with uh, looking at ways that uh, genetics can make a big difference. So as Jason said, Megan will be talking more next week about the genetics, but I'm just going to talk a little bit uh, about some of the technology. Um, we're looking at, in this program, mice. And the reason we're looking at mice is because it's a model organism. Um, and to talk about what, how gene drives work, uh, if we had an edited gene in a mouse, of a, a, a modified mouse genome in the old sense of the word, uh, using normal inheritance, and it was crossed or bred with a wild type, we would have even distribution of those genes. If, again, the wild type uh, mouse bred, we would have, again, 50% distribution. So you'll see the gene characteristic, um, the characteristic gene be lost over time. So with some of the gene drives that are being looked at in G-Bird and uh, other programs, we have ways of potentially 
having a characteristic that is pushed into the next generation, so higher than Mendelian uh, uh, inheritance. And again, if we breed, uh, and it's this showing 100%, we have uh, this characteristic pushed through the population. Austin Burke came up with this idea, I think, in 2003. And the idea is to use this drive to put a gene that would affect the fitness of the population is problematic, in this case, the ones that are causing the extinctions. And so one way to look at that is to affect the sex ratio. So if all of the offspring ended up being one uh, sex, in this case male, we would eventually have uh, a contained population that is all male and eventually uh, extinguishes itself. So now this is the technical uh, ideas, but I'm again going to talk more about the responsible innovation aspects of what we're trying to do in the program. This, uh, this program was brought together by a set of principles. And I'm going to read these because I know that this is being recorded and this uh, I don't know if you can see it clearly. But the first word is caution. Proceed cautiously with deliberate, stepwise, and measurable outcomes. Engage early and often with different communities, including the research community, the regulator community, community uh, general publics, and other stakeholders. Commit to biosafety, uh, both the existing regulations, best practices, and using those as a minimum. So whatever we're supposed to do, that's just the start. And as we uh, move forward, not only use the best practices that are out there, but also contribute to them. This is a big one. Only operate in countries with a, an appropriate regulatory capacity that has the ability to regulate this technology, and then be transparent with research, uh, assessments, findings, and conclusions. So uh, let's go to where we are operating. The, orga the organizations that are involved in uh, this program include Island Conservation, National Wildlife Research Center, North Carolina State University, Texas A&M, and those are the organizations based in the United States. In Australia, we have CSIRO, the science arm of the Australian government, as well as the University of Adelaide, and finally in New Zealand, we have Land Care Research. So those are the, the geographies in the political systems that we are looking at. So as we break down this program, I would like to go over a, a little map. Um, actually, this map was made by Jake Hunt, who's in the room today, and when he was uh, volunteering with Island Conservation, so thank you, Jake. Got a lot of uh, use out of this. And so this helps me to identify all of the different aspects that are kind of required for uh, responsible innovation. So uh, in the coordination aspect, um, which is what I do, uh, we try to figure out a way to move forward, how we're going to make decisions and such. So we put together a steering committee, and each of the organizations have contributors into that steering committee that is the decision-making process of uh, when we decide to add a different uh, uh, partner or different technology and such. Uh, how are we going to come together in the first place? Obviously, there's not, or originally there was not any money associated with uh, dedicated uh, projects. So we uh, established a memorandum of understanding of all of the organizations, which is non-binding. It's basically just a handshake to say, hey, how are we going to, how are we going to operate? How are we going to dance? And uh, because it, this, or, this partnership includes three governmental institutions, including the United States Department of Agriculture, Land Care Research, and CSIRO out of Australia. It had to be reviewed by the State Department twice, actually. So that was a, that was a big deal to get these signatures on here. And there's two deans from NCSU that participated in this, uh, in this agreement. So I think it's pretty historic, and uh, it really puts our effort at the pointy edge of, again, this technology development, especially the technology development in the public good sphere. 
So backing up to that program map, one of the aspects that we need to have for each of these different focus areas are leaders. And obviously, you know, through the introduction, I'm a microbiologist by training. This is a complex and unfamiliar technology uh, to you, to quote uh, uh, one of the previous colloquial speakers. And so we need to move forward cautiously. So again, putting uh, folks involved uh, to really be the point people for the different aspects of these uh, focus areas is important. Um, I will say that the Independent Ethics Advisory Committee is not in the, the, the mix because we're really trying to keep that activity financially independent and stand alone outside to be able to, uh, to advise us as a group. Okay, so uh, back to the map. I'm going to bounce around a little bit and give updates in different, in different areas. So the biology, as we talked about, the genetic, the mouse development that is occurring at University of Adelaide and Texas A&M, um, as well as mate choice that is going on at North Carolina State University. Megan's going to talk more about that next, next week. I would like to say that of all of these different areas of activity, only two of them focus on the genetic engineering of mice. Everything else is, again, to try to do this right, to do this uh, appropriately and responsibly. So, stakeholder engagement. Uh, I will point out that Jason is the lead for the U.S. section of the stakeholder engagement in the activities that are ongoing. And um, there are stakeholder workshops actually being scheduled in the relatively near future. Is that right, Jason? Within the next year, yeah. Okay, within the next year. and some of the uh, aspects that are going to be looked at are what are the most valuable design characteristics as we move forward in this space? What are, are, do, are there hidden stakeholders that we don't know about? And Jason and team um, are bringing together conservation organizations to try to figure out some of these questions. Is there anything you would like to add to that, Jason? Um, I mean, I'll just say that we're, so we're doing a landscape analysis, which is interviews um, and review of media materials and things like that to try to understand what is the landscape around this issue. It, it, it's, it's a little bit hidden because the technology doesn't exist um, and so not a lot of people know about it. Um, and so we're trying to understand what are, what's out there that we need to pay attention to. Um, the, the stakeholder workshop is designed to inform a specific effort um, that may or may not be funded that would allow us to go out into communities near potential island sites to do focus groups with, you know, regular community members, people who live near there, um, and to think about engaging them about what they understand about this, what their preferences are, what their attitudes would be about this kind of technology. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to back up a little bit and also say there's not only stakeholder engagement happening in the United States in the focus in using this technology within the political boundaries of the U.S., but also it is ongoing in Australia somewhat in New Zealand, excuse me, and at a global level at the organizations like the IUCN and CBD, the United Nations, and Todd Kugin is involved in, uh, in those areas, and the global stakeholder engagement as well. So where are we? Risk assessment. So um, in the risk assessment that's actually going to start in the very near future, it is being led by CSIRO. And uh, the hopes are to identify environmental hazards and out adverse outcome pathways that are associated with the uncontained release of trans effector drive mice. So these mice are uh, ones that are, tr uh, as we develop the technology, we're trying to contain them spatially uh, using some, some uh, hypotheses that are being worked out at the uh, University of Adelaide. Um, the analysis will also be guided by some of the values and concerns identified by the stakeholder engagement activities that are going on. So we are linking risk assessment with stakeholder engagement in an attempt to get all of the issues out on the table and assess them. You 
U.S. regulatory. It's a complex system that's governed by generally three organizations, as discussed a couple weeks ago, the United States uh, Environmental Protection Agency, Food and Drug Administration, and the United States Department of Agriculture. Um, we have put together kind of a concept of, of where we're at to remind everyone we don't have a mouse. It's still in development. So we've already met we uh, different uh, uh, researchers and uh, myself have met with regulators two or three times already. And this is before the technology is even developed in the laboratory. Um, and so Island Conservation is kind of coordinating that, not myself, but Greg Howell, and trying to navigate the complex uh, regulatory system. It was just a couple months ago decided that initially our technology will be um, uh, basically overseen by the Food and Drug Administration, so not the EPA and the pesticide section. So that was a little bit of a surprise, but that's where it landed in the uh, mix of regulators. Okay, so let's talk about the Independent Ethics Advisory Committee. Uh, this is being led by Elizabeth Heitman. Again, we're trying to keep this as separate as possible. Um, I've been in talks with her extensively over the past six months. Uh, Elizabeth helped uh, co-chair the Gene Drives on the Horizon report from the National Academy of Science, of which Jason was on. So, um, Fred serves on the Target Malaria Ethics Board, so we have a, a lot of different perspectives to try to get this right, to get it independent, to really get it focused on, um, on uh, process forward. I will say that it was decided that this will not be binding. If there is a concern that ethics committee has, and they say, we don't think this, this, is, uh, this is appropriate, it will not stop the rest of the program, but we are creating mechanisms to where it will be public. That will be known that there is a disagreement and kind of put the impetus to try to work it out. We are at the point of uh, finalizing the charter and getting the steering committee to pose the first question or questions to the uh, ethics advisory committee. So this is moving along pretty well. Communications and media. We do have a website. Um, I just pulled the screenshot from my uh, computer. Uh, we have ways in, in this. Uh, there are ways that questions can be posed, info at geneticbiocontrol.org. Uh, I will say that there's not been a lot of um, uh, action or questions that come out of this website. One of the ways that we're going to uh, it was just decided in the last steering committee, one of the ways that we're going to increase transparency is post the um, steering committee minutes, the notes from those meetings on here. Post the trip reports that different folks go, uh, the trips that they take to try to move this uh, program forward in exploration uh, on the website. So to increase uh, awareness of activities and again, transparency. So a little bit of history, uh, going back, I would like to point out a couple of things. In 2015, the TSRY meeting, or the Island Mice meeting, that uh, this program was originally called, occurred in Fort Collins, Colorado. And uh, that's where the idea was to formalize and bring together a memorandum of understanding, hire a coordinator, and uh, really focus on the technology in a responsible manner. So that idea was to formalize. The next meeting was in uh, Raleigh, North Carolina, at North Carolina State University. And really the focus was uh, getting sustainability out of this, into this program. So having the researchers apply for grants, try to get funding, and this occurs independently, uh, it, but we try to let the others be aware of who's applying for what grants, who's approaching uh, different funders. So a lot of 2016 was spent trying to increase the likelihood of sustainable uh, ability to explore this technology. 
And in 2017, uh, in November, we had the meeting in Washington, D.C. Um, it was the first meeting where the whole steering committee was there, and actually most of the focus area leads, I think we only had one or two of the focus area leaders that on the big map that were not able to make it. We invited regulators, we invited those who are contributing to the research efforts of the uh, researchers, and many of them came. So again, the regulators were able to see firsthand what we're trying to do, how we're trying to do it, and where we are in the program. So if you recall, there's three countries involved, and the last three meetings have been in the United States. So uh, we're looking at having the next meeting in Western Australia. Uh, that's a good motivation if anybody wants to be involved in the program. <laughs> uh, so uh, some of the uh, focus is because uh, in Australia, we can interact and kind of share with the regulators down there what our program is doing, how we're trying to um, develop the technology and, uh, and assess societal values during that. Um, I would like to say that having multiple countries involved has really given me perspective. So uh, one of the things I've noticed that in Australia, their, their focus on the invasive species problem and how it affects uh, conservation and agriculture and other aspects of society is much more, uh, is very aware. So they, they as a society are very focused on the invasive species problem. So that's, that's something that uh, I came away with my visits to Australia. One of the things I like to point out around uh, New Zealand is that their involvement in inclusion of indigenous peoples is not an afterthought. It's not something that they say, okay, how are we going to include? It's just something that happens. They are at a place where if there is a societal decision, uh, the Maori are going to be involved in that. It's not an afterthought. It's not even effortful. It's already very much structural. And they might say that there is more work to be done. I'm sure that might be true. But I think what we can do is learn from each other what's going on in the United States and technology development regulatory aspects in all the different three countries, and the different social and um, uh, societal aspects that are very beneficial. Um, and I think with that, I will open it up, and again, kind of this is just the start of where we're going to go. I would hope that you will, um, well, number one, thank you for showing up. Uh, <laughs> I felt that everybody pretty much listened, and now uh, I would like to again talk about the discussion. This is a colloquium, this is not a, a seminar series, and there's an opportunity to influence the activities. This is a dynamic aspect, this is a dynamic program. That program map is constantly kind of changing and, and moving, so uh, uh, let's, let's go ahead and start that. And I would just say there are a lot of contributors to the program, there are a lot of influencers. I would hope that you all uh, influence as well. So uh, let's open it up. So you're trying to eradicate rodents from islands, but the rodents typically get there by accident, right? Correct. So is there any thought being currently given to, you know, if this works and we eradicate rodents from these islands, or invasive rodents, and we somehow managed not to eradicate rodents worldwide. Um, is there any thought currently being given to keeping those rodents then off those islands? Or is it just assumed that it'll be a constant cycle of rein reinfestation, control, eradication, okay. reinfestation? So uh, I appreciate the question. And I. Uh, We'll, all, we'll point out that, so it's a great question because what are we going to do about it? There, there's a concern of, uh, and let me read into this a little bit, there's a concern about what happens if that mouse gets off of the island. A little bit. I, but also, are we still going to just have to keep on going back? Right. So, 
Um, Island Conservation has been in the business of, of doing this, and one of the aspects that is looked at when conducting in island eradication is the biosecurity. The, the biosecurity and containment of those islands. How, what are the uh, practices in place to prevent just what you're explaining? Um, again, and I, I value my perspective working in three different countries. Uh, I would note that, well, let me give you just another little bit of background. I, I worked on the Ebola outbreak uh, in West Africa with Doctors Without Borders, and so dealt with a lot of biosecurity dealing with human infection. So that's something that I do have uh, experience with. When I go to, when I went to New Zealand, it appeared that biosecurity and keeping invasive organisms out of their country, out of their islands, is a point of patriotic pride, if I may, and I hope I'm not stepping on toes, but, you know, in the airport, you know, they ask a series of questions. It's pretty in-depth. It's kind of like it really is a security process. So I would say to just answer your question, yes, biosecurity and future biosecurity of the islands uh, is something that's very important. Current eradications cost millions of dollars. <laughs> so just the return on investment, when you're spreading literally thousands of tons of rodenticide, it's expensive. Uh, we, we don't want it to be successful and we don't want to have to re-navigate, uh, so that's part of the process, yes. So it sounds like you're saying they're real good at the having the door work one way, but part of what your answer was is to have a door that blocks both ways and not have the escaping modified animals leaving. Can you address that particular part of it? Because it's my interpretation of what you said is some places are real good at the keeping it out, but that would be a very different system than preventing it from leaving. Okay. So what you're talking about is the um, basically the safety of the technology that we are investigating. Containability. Containability. Okay. So some of uh, the, the program researchers are involved in a uh, effort to really spatially limit the technologies that's being developed, both molecularly um, and in ways that uh, include different um, activities. And I'll bring up, Kevin Esfeld has brought up and touted uh, the DAISY system as a way of containment. Um, our, some of our researchers, led by John Godwin, are looking at ways to spatially limit that, uh, focused on the genetics of islands, actually specifically looking at the invasion might uh, lend itself to um, unique genetic characteristics that can be utilized to focus only in that geographical area. And I would like, if John would like to extrapolate, because biosafety is very important, uh, so it's, I really appreciate the yeah. question, John. Sure. And I think one thing, if you go back about six years, we were talking about this, it was really thinking, you know, if you're ever going to try this, a remote oceanic island would be the place you'd want to go, right? So it was actually initially thinking about containment, actually even more than biodiversity protection, that sort of led to this. And then we, with connections with island conservation, I think maybe certainly for me it was brought home that this could have also really important biodiversity implications. I mean, I knew about that before I actually went to grad school in Hawaii, which is unfortunately a case study in extinctions due to invasive species. Um, but actually they, the original uh, interest in this was precisely from a containment standpoint. Um, then just what Royden mentioned, uh, so one of the things we're looking at is, you know, you get these places colonized and you have founder effects. And so if you've got a target in that population that's not in an adjacent mainland population, in theory, in theory, <laughs> I haven't tested it, then you've got a, a situation where your gene drive can function on the island, but even if it did get off, it shouldn't have a target in a population it would escape to is the way we're approaching it. But so that all has to be tested. So. so the approach is to use the technology as a mechanism of containment that doesn't rely on border security, shipping security. I think that would be important as a part. I don't think you'd want to uh, I, I, not have all the other parts as well. Exactly. Uh, ideally layers, but yeah, molecular containment. Yes. In theory, is possible. 
but again, we have to test that. So. I would just also say in biosafety and human disease containment, it's also reliant on a series of layers. You're not relying on just one thing. Uh, but it's very important to look at all of the things and look at, at them systematically, which is what we're trying to do. And again, kind of bring in how we might be able to do it better from, from larger groups, from publics. The question has to do with trade-offs. So this is like a, a, a new technology, and it's, you are the only ones right now developing a mouse that, or, or a rodent that, that has a certain technology for whatever understand but I, I want to, to take the case of mosquitoes where there are different technologies that could that an institution could uh, to take uh, to approach uh, the same problem and in terms of biosafety some people have decided that they first want to try with non-gene drive system uh, uh, local extinctions what would keep I know that your approach is having a gene drive system, but what would keep another group of scientists to develop uh, safer in terms of perception or a, at least reversible uh, system to use it and to expand it, uh, even if it means that it's not that uh, effective? So let me just make sure that I have your question right. Uh, is the question, what, what might be being done in other groups to work on the same concept of eradication of pests using genetic technologies and other technologies? Just genetic technology, but not, not gene right system. Okay. From the point of view of a regulator, why would you choose one from another? Okay. So I can talk to you about why we chose the, the path that we're, we're taking, and again, this the decisions made and the, the effort started before the CRISPR-Cas9 gene drive um, was in place. And that was a, uh, a gene drive that is native to mus musculus. And so in the systematic looking at that horizon scan by and Fred and, and John, uh, Carl, my, my director, was involved in that trying to just figure out what, it, what are we going to put our time and effort into that would be effective and safe. Um, that's why we chose looking at gene drives uh, that affect population fitness. Might there be other groups out there that are working on a genetic technology that's safer and uh, either, uh, e easily, more easily um, acceptable? Uh, and uh, generally better, I think that would be great. Uh, that, that's not something that, you know, where we as a, as a group of, of organizations are all nonprofit. So Island Conservation is an NGO, nonprofit environmental organization. We have three, um, three governmental institutions and four academic institutions. So we don't have any for-profit companies involved in this. We're really just trying to develop a technology that is safe and effective and, and uh, aligned with the values of the groups that we, the publics that we are dealing with. Did that answer your question? It was kind of a complex question, so I, I want to make sure yeah. that I'm hitting it. Um, when it comes to those values, I was wondering, as like island conservation, both as a whole and specifically for this project, um, how much opposition there is, so people with different values, um, and how you approach that um, when it arises. So inside island conservation? Yeah, for all the different projects, that is. So from outside sources with different value systems, like people who strongly oppose if there are those people. Um, so for outside of island conservation, yeah. organizations that strongly oppose. Mm -hmm. Yes, we're, we're, um, we're dealing with that right now. Um, there is a, a very large uh, open records request going on, uh, and it's by organizations that I think, uh, and I might, I hope I'm not misrepresenting, but will never uh, accept gene drives as a potential solution, uh, uh, and we are trying to not go the opposite way of saying this is the solution, but is it the solution? Is it going to be effective, number one, and safe, number two, not necessarily in that order. Um, how we deal with it is uh, 
I guess, you know, some of the things that I've learned here at North Carolina State University that have come out of the Genetic Engineering Society Center, for the most part, this is where I'm based, I mean, at Penn and CSU, and in Island Conservation is really find out how people feel about it. Are they opposed? Why are they opposed? And start to address not only the science, but also the values. And um, again, the, the, the folks in this room are much better uh, and more expert in, in that field. And so I will gladly follow and arrange meetings and, and try to contribute because I am pretty passionate about addressing organizations that are opposed with respect and, uh, and as much openness as possible. So, did that answer your question? Yeah, it did. Okay, um, yeah. What about for previous projects compared to this one? Okay, that didn't so, yes. Um, again, I'm based at North Carolina State University, mm -hmm. so I'm not based at Island Conservation, but I do know when you're trying to prevent an extinction and it causes the death of a lot of animals, uh, there's going to be opposition to that. So they have, we have experienced uh, organizations that are opposed to using pesticides, opposed to killing. Um, how they have, uh, how we have dealt with that as island conservation is engage with um, some of the animal welfare organizations. Uh, Greg Howell, who is dealing with the, the um, regulatory aspect, published a paper with uh, what are the best practices of wildlife management, uh, looking at chart the compassionate um, uh, dealing of wildlife when you have to do unpleasant aspects to it. Um, how else do we deal with that? Uh, again, just stakeholder engagement. Island Conservation does a lot of stakeholder engagement. First, sure. and then Jim. Okay, so my question is, so you're going to have to introduce them in certain amounts so that their gene drive is picked up by the local population. But then that also means that it increases the competition it has with the endangered and critically endangered species. So mm -hmm. how do you plan to control the amount of um, mice you have to introduce while trying to mitigate the initial negative effect of doing that? If you notice, um, oh, sorry. If you notice, I, uh, did not talk about every aspect of this program. And this is where the modeling groups of which Alan Lloyd, is Alan still here? Yeah. <laughs> uh, is is uh, leading uh, some of the US efforts in that. But you can see all of the lines, land care research, North Carolina State University, Adelaide, CSIRO, all of them have modelers that are contributing or able and w willing to contribute to answering just that question. And so really that comes to a risk assessment in uh, what are some of the negative outcomes that could happen if we move forward. Um, increasing the amount of uh, predators on an island is certainly something that could affect the targets that we're trying to protect. Uh, and that would have to come out in the modeling and, uh, and the complicated. Alan, do you want to add on to that? I'm not a model, or, or even Fred here. Uh, uh, why don't you, Kevin, talk about that? Oh, sure. So, so Greg Backus, who was a former PhD student in this program, did a PhD dissertation looking at exactly that question. Um, and it's a, it's a very salient insight. Um, and what he was able to show is that there's a tension between um, how well the gene drive transmits itself um, and the non-target effects on the island. That is to say, if you have a gene drive that transmits itself very effectively, then you might achieve eradication very quickly and have less of an impact on the rest of the ecosystem on the island, but that also raises the risk of non-target effects if that mouse were to escape. Whereas the reverse side of that tension is that if the gene drive is less sort of effective at propagating itself such that the, the eradication effort requires further introductions, um, then you're at less of a risk of escape leading to non-target effects. Um, but you do then have to introduce more mice onto the island for the sake of eradicating the mice. Um, so there's a, there's a sweet spot in there, um, but it's sort of at the, the, at the balance point between those two forces. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Yes, Jim. I have a 
question about your ethics advisory board person process. Um, so this is a developing program, which means their decision is yet to be made. Yes. Is your ethics person going to, at the end, tell you what was ethical? Or <laughs> is this an iterative process? It or is, is this like all, you know, uh, beforehand? Yeah, so uh, the question, I guess, to distill it down just a few words, are we greenwashing this? Or are we just like, you know, what is the structure to, to make it effective of getting to an ethical process? So um, the charter has just been developed. We're in the final stages. We will post that on the, on the website. Um, it is going to go kind of both ways. We're going to give access to some meetings and certainly meeting minutes and, and Elizabeth will have all of that. She's pulling together. Uh, it's not just her. It's, it's a group of people with expertise in ethics. Um, but also the steering committee will pose questions. Hey, you know, this, this uh, is something that we have a question about, whether, you know, funding or a, a, a trait that, we're, that is being considered for exploration. Um, whatever it is, it will come together from the steering committee to ask the ethics committee, but there will also be a level of transparency that allows the ethics committee to say, hey, this, this isn't making sense, or can you explain it more? Um, and that balance, that, that sweet spot is still in, in development. Um, Fred, do you have any other thoughts? You're the one with the most ethics committee experience. And <laughs> yeah, well, that's an interesting thing, because I'm on the ethics committee for the target of malaria. And um, you know, this whole thing of keeping it separate and what's its role. We're also an advisory group. We don't make decisions for them. Um, but it's been an interesting ride to see that. And I think that we've learned from that group uh, one thing that's happening now is trying to make that target malaria ethics group more independent. Mm -hmm. Because in the beginning, they pull it together, and the people who sort of call the meetings and stuff have been part of the target malaria group. Whereas uh, I think that Roy is being very careful to have them sort of separated out. But it does become an interesting issue for an ethics committee because it's different than medical ethics and all of that. So it's easy to find people who have that kind of background in a medical ethics, and, but they're not that savvy about the, some of the kinds of things that the gene drive is. So it's an interesting combination. But I, I don't know if I have any real answers, but it seems like it is something that's an iterative process. So they try to keep us up to date, but how do they keep us exactly up to date? How do they actually make sure that we understand what they're doing? Yeah. So of course we have to go to Africa. Australia, New Zealand, you know, all ethics committees <laughs> should definitely go to the Galapagos. That's right. We are trying that's to an ethical do, decision. That's right. <laughs> we are trying to make sure that there is indigenous representation on the ethics committee. Uh, maybe not from every geography, but from at least some geographies. Um, and uh, I guess you know our guiding principle is not only to abide by the best practices and the groups that have come before us, like target malaria, but also contribute to an improvement in the process and have a positive influence on, on that. So that's our intention. Yes, Jason. So my understanding is that the recently the EPA took charge of regulating um, mosquitoes that are meant to eradicate mosquito populations. So looking at that um, technology as a pesticide. Right. Yes. And what you just told us was that the FDA is taking the lead on regulating this mouse. So yes. that's a contradiction. Can you say more about why that might have happened? Um, I'm not sure why. Uh, every kind of decision, the, the industry guidance, they call it industry even though we're not an industry, uh, the industry guidance says you know, kind of the gateway is through FDA, it's an FDA document, and then it's kind of um, uh, assessed by EPA and, you know, all of the organizations uh, collectively. Um, as you know, uh, EPA and FDA were, rep were had representatives kind of uh, uh, at the last meeting that we had, um, and we put the question to them, hey, where is this going to land? And so I would say, at this time, it's with the FDA. Uh, that decision was made, so it kind of gives us good, um, good process of, of how to address it. 
but kind of like the mosquitoes, they, that was in the FDA and then it, it switched over. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't know what's going to happen in the future, but right now we have a little direction. Uh, how that decision came about, I'm not, I'm not sure. I have not asked the question, but I'm not confident that, you know, mm -hmm. it would be totally forthcoming. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody want to? Uh, I think nobody knows. They probably don't even That's right. Well, <laughs> well, I, mean, I, would speculate, I would speculate that it may be that the uh, FDA has done more analysis of genetically modified mice as new animal drugs, mm -hmm. and there haven't been a lot of GM mosquitoes. And so you're tying into processes and expertise that exist at FDA that exist for mice that don't exist for mosquitoes. So that, that would be my guess. That, that's uh, uh, definitely a, a very valid hypothesis. Uh, the vet veterinary group at the FDA is the veterinary biotechnology group that, that does that. And I believe that our, our group of researchers are pretty far along in the, uh, looking at gene drives in ma mammalian systems, uh, but we're pretty open about what we're trying to do. I don't know what's going on in, in other companies, and, and like you said, they might have access and they might be regulating gene drives or, you know, in, in private industry, uh, you know. Or just, G I mean, GM mice for medical purposes have oh, yeah. been around for quite a long time. So. And that would be yes, John. I was thinking if we could add, I mean, what we hope to do is to work closely with the regulatory agencies so any data we collect are actually useful to them, too, if they think about and deliberate in this soon. So with that kind of coordination, because they, you know, they're working through how to regulate these things. And so. Yeah. Yes. Could you talk a little more about the difference between the Ethics Advisory Board and the stakeholder engagement? Part, just in terms of the types of questions that they're going to be engaging with, because I think some people would see lots of overlap between those two. But like, what type of questions are the ethics advisory committee going to be engaging with, and how do those differ from the types of questions and issues that the stakeholder engagement people will be? Engaging? Okay, we're kind of still at the hypothetical aspect, but um, I, I would imagine uh, areas like. Um, would it, you know, let's say there's a mechanism that, that uh, instead of creating just the male uh, population and allows the population to die out through attrition, uh, so natural life cycle of these animals, um, uh, maybe there's a, a, a technology that would actually kill them uh, in, in the process. Uh, so uh, kind of, I, I imagine, questions of would this be ethical or would this be more ethical than uh, trying to go longer term. Uh, I imagine concerns over uh, funding. Uh, is it okay that we or some researchers in the organ in that are associated with G-Bird, some of the, the PIs, uh, have taken, have ex to, uh, conducted contracts with the military under DARPA? Um, is, you know, wish we had the ethics committee uh, in place uh, in 2016, but we, we did not. Um, so we struggled with that, and, and, and not struggled with it, but asked ourselves the questions of, uh, is this the right thing to do? So um, other areas of, uh, of uh, ethics uh, would include expenditures as well. That's something, yes, Fred? Well, I, I would just comment that at least with the target malaria, the ethics committee oversees the engagement, right? So you ask, is the engagement group doing an ethical job of doing engagement? So it's a different level that you're talking about. So, but there is some interaction between those two. Well, yeah, yeah. So you know, yeah. the Gates group, right, is already going to Africa and doing engagement in Africa. So the question to the ethics group is, okay, is this the way we should be doing? And what you know, what's going to happen if we have corruption here? Or, how should we be dealing with those kind of issues? So I think actually probably there's more in the way of that kind of oversight over the engagement kind of thing than even over the biology. Mm -hmm. Jason, anything else on the stakeholder engagement aspect? That's a no, that's really interesting. Yeah. We, we haven't really been able to wrestle with that because the, the ethics committee hasn't been formed. But I think that's a, I mean, I, they could be a real resource for, for stakeholder and community engagement in terms of clarifying the kinds of issues that we should be talking to people about and giving their perspectives on. Um, so I, I think that could be really useful. 
One, one time for one question, maybe. Is that right, Jason? Sure. Okay, yes, Jason. Um, so, who owns this technology? It's developed by three countries. There's governments involved. There's nonprofits. Who gets, who gets, who gets to decide? Which country gets the technology first? Which islands go first? I mean, one of the big issues in GE technology is control, right? Who controls it and those type of things. So how are you guys going to decide who gets, gets the technology? Who gets to employ it? Well, is it owned by these governments? Is it owned by the nonprofit? Okay, that's, those, those, there's, a lot, there's a lot to unpack there. It's not, just, uh, it's not just this group of people that makes that decision. Certainly, it's the regulators in Australia, United States, New Zealand. We're not going to go outside of that for the initial uh, you know, assessments. Um, the stakeholders would say if there is a adamant, we do not want this, that the government, the public, that the conservation community, they, they would have a say in the process. So uh, again, I think it's an iterative aspect and we're going to rely on the engagement groups to, 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 to understand that. We're going to rely on the regulatory groups and then ultimately the uh, steering committee. So, uh, and then of course standard IP aspects probably uh, are, are um, in place here. The, the individuals that actually create the technology will probably um, have the, the patent authority, but we're, we're early, early on those stages because it's not looked at as a money-making endeavor right now, so that's, that's it. Please join me in thank you very much. Can I say one more thing? Sure. Uh, there, there were a lot of great questions. I'm also available uh, after colloquia. Uh, if you don't want to ask a question or, or ask me about an aspect, uh, I'm available outside of this. John, Fred, Jason, others that are involved in the process. So please uh, ask further ask questions and I, I welcome comments as well. So thank you. Yep. And we'll continue this this discussion of this general topic next week with Megan's talk. Um, and if you want to participate in the discussion section with Brighton on Thursday, again that's noon, 2321 Gardner Hall, um, and we will have a reading um, on Moodle for that as well. So thank you.